So now I'm going to talk about uh, when I designed the saxophone for Ed Jones. Uh, Ed, uh, I got to know him quite well because he was teaching at Leeds College of Music. Uh, he's a head uh, lecturer over there. And anyone who actually knows Ed, he's so easy to get on with. You know what I mean? The amount of drunken nights that we had together was, was, was great. But as, as we actually talk and interact, I always find with Ed, it's great because I'd, it'd be interesting to see a third person actually listening to because as the conversations go, we draw more out of each other. Uh, so we're actually going to do some live performances on uh, how I design instruments and stuff and I'm going to get Ed to actually demonstrate at the same time. We'll be doing these over at Leeds College of Music to start, but then we might actually go on the road a little bit more uh, with this because we just yell, you know, when you just, you just click. It's like when you meet somebody for the first time, but you have this like frequency, this like, wow, this guy's meant to be in my life. And you, you don't, you can't explain it at the time. I do live in the world where the next person who's going to change my life I haven't met yet. So I always treat that the next person that I meet with respect because I just don't know what he's going to actually bring. The universe has actually put him in my life for some reason. And this is what Ed, Ed was. So Ed was actually work, coming in the shop, chatting and stuff like that. And he saw me working on uh, Pete Wareham's sax. Uh, he had the privilege of actually uh, play testing it before I took it down to Pete. And when he played it, he just like, wow, you know, this is this is incredible. So I said to him, well, do you want me to make you one? You know, and he's like, you know, oh, yeah, fantastic. So uh, after I'd given Pete in, uh, Ed was the next one I sort of worked on. And again, Ed's more of a jazz, full-on jazz sort of player. Uh, he hasn't got that massive attitude, still puts a lot of air through it. He uses, he uses a massive tip uh, mouthpiece. Um, he actually got it from Roland Kirk. He was actually made... Um, Bert Larson made it for Roland Cup, but he never actually went into it, which is an interesting story. If you ever get to hook up with Ed, just ask him these stories, because he'll, he'll, uh, you'll have to buy him a pint now, because he likes to drink and talk. <laughs> but so does everybody. So what you end up with when you're actually working with uh, Ed is, you, you, again, I listen to his music. I learned him, learn to understand him as a personality in it, uh, built the home. He was a lot easier to work with because he was more of a rounder jazz type of player. Uh, what I mean by that is you know what he's, you know what he's trying to get out of the horn. It's more technical. It's more, um, he, he wants the attack, but he also wants that ballady type of playing, you know, um, and he can play any style and he, he's very versatile, he's, he's Ed. So I try to build more of a roundy type of um, saxophone. Uh, it would suit more, more, more players, whereas I think when I did Pete Williams, it was quite a dead type of horn because of how much power he puts into it that a normal jazzer would play it. I remember the guy that used to work for us, I'm not going to mention his name, but he played it and he said, that's the worst saxophone I've ever played when he tested Pete's. And I said, good, I'm, I'm glad you don't like it because I haven't made it for you. You know, whereas Ed's, if he played Ed's, he'd be like, oh, God, this is fantastic because it was very, very similar to a Selmer SBA was Ed's, just had a bit more... Um, guts, a bit more balls in the actual sort of sound with it all. Um, so now we're going to watch a video that Ed's done, he's recorded in his house, because all these videos of the endorsers were done in a lockdown period, um, and he, he'll actually explain, he plays a little bit, then he'll explain to you why he likes it, he'll also explain how we actually met um, with this. So again, I'll put a short video version of it on this actual documentary that we're doing. Uh, if you want to see the full um, link, then follow the YouTube link that I'll put up at the end uh, and then enjoy. <laughs>
Hi there, my name is Ed Jones. I'm just here to talk a little bit about this amazing saxophone that uh, was made for me a few years ago by uh, a great saxophone um, colossus of knowledge and uh, craft and expertise and wisdom, uh, a man called Dave Walker, who lives in Leeds and uh, who is at the, in my opinion, at the forefront of creating modern saxophones that are without precedent, really, because um, I've tried a lot of modern horns in the last 30 years, and I liked a lot of them, and um, not enough to, to buy one, or, or to be fortunate enough to be endorsed by a saxophone company that, that I really, I don't know, bought into the product, in, in a way. Um, I'll... I'll I did endorse Yannick Isawas very briefly in the 1990s, um, and they wanted me to. They wanted me to play their tenor, and I, I was very honest with them, and I said, "Look, it's a, it's a good horn, but it's not as good as my Selma SBA Super Balanced Action. There's nowhere, there's no comparison. I mean, it's, you know, it's a really good horn, but this is the horn that I love, and it's my horn." And, so it didn't really come to anything. I, 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 I played their sopranos for a while. And the sopranos are nice, don't get me wrong. They're, you know, I'm not here to slag off other saxophones. Um, but anyway, to cut a long story short, I've been play, I was playing my summer SBA for nearly, well, well, over 25 years. Let's cut a long story short. Over 25 years. Same mouthpiece. Berg Larsen, 145 of 1. No, sorry, 140 of 1, which was is a 10-star. Uh, the mouthpiece was made for Roland Kirk uh, at the Berg Larsen factory, and he never picked it up. And I was very fortunate to come across it at some point, and it kind of blew me away. It had been altered. It had been opened up to an 11-star. At that point, I was playing very open mouthpieces. Well, I still do. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later. But... Um, to cut a long story short, I wasn't looking for a new saxophone. I wasn't looking for a new mouthpiece. And about five years ago, uh, I went to see Dave uh, Walker at his Woodwind and Brass shop in Leeds, which is just around the corner from where I teach at Leeds College of Music. And he showed me a prototype of this model and said, you want to try it? And I tried it. And the sound was amazing. I mean, it was just fabulous, fantastic sound. And I was blown away by it. Um, and the reason that I was blown away by it was that suddenly there was a sound in there which sounded like my, myself, but also something that I didn't recognize. There was something new in the sound. And it still sounded like me. It felt like me. It it, I recognized the sound, but there was a quality in the sound that was different. And I was immediately kind of entranced, uh, spellbound, really. I mean, you know, sound is, is, sound can cast spells over you. Even your own sound can, you know, can cast spells over you. Well, you know, that's, that's another thing. If you really get into sound, it, it's, that's, that's what frequencies do. They, 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 when they hit you in the right spot, then they, they cast a spell over you. I think, in my humble opinion, I would, I would add. So anyway, I'm in Dave's shop and I'm playing and I'm transfixed by the sound that, that's coming out of the horn. And I'm realizing that basically the, the setup is very, it's, I, mean, I have small hands. So the setup is pretty much like a, old 1920s, 1930s con and, and, and the spread of the finger spread is very big. So, I mean, it was very hard for me to play. And I said, well, listen, if you ever, ever sort out the, the stack, I'd be very interested in, um, be very interested in, in this horn. Two years later, I'm taking my SBA in to be repaired. And he said, yeah, uh, Hey, I have something for you to try. And it was this horn. And uh, little did I know. Uh, anyway. 
I, I, the same thing happened. I, I, I blew it and I was just like, wow, wow, this is, this is amazing. It, it's, again, it was something that sounded familiar, it sounded like me, but something different was there. There was an essence, there was a essence in the sound, there was something in the sound that was, that was different. I was very, very, very hooked and very intrigued. So at the end of about, I don't know, what seemed to be an hour, but it was probably only 10 minutes, I, I remember saying to Dave, Wow, how much does one of these cost? And he was silent for a minute and then he said, well, you know, if you help to sell it, then uh, it's yours, effectively. And I was like bowled over by the generosity of it. So um, I didn't need much persuasion to endorse the saxophones. Um, it, 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 it's... It is very clear from when you play them personally, and, and I will speak personally because everybody is different and everybody reacts to saxophones as differently as there is grains of, well, I don't know, it, it, as differently as there are fingerprints. There we go. As differently, as, as, as much as there are the amount of fingerprints, people react to saxophones in, in, in different ways. But for me personally, they're unprecedented as a modern horn and why it made me want to put my old Selma SBA in its case and not play it again is, is really simple. It, it's, it opened me up to exploring a new, new sounds and new expressions that, that I probably wouldn't have got to if I had stayed on my SBA. And right from the start, just playing a long note. The richness of the sound, the, the ease with the creation of the air column and, and pushing the air column through the horn and the the ease of the upper register, particularly. It's just how it, its behavior is very uniform all the way through the horn. It's very big, and the quieter you play it, retains its presence. Uh, when you overblow it, I'm not really warmed up today, but you notice that's a, that's a, that was a top F, um, and it and it 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 doesn't uh, doesn't feel like it's gonna give in when you get up there. Top F. Actually got an A above that before and which is completely nuts and it actually shouldn't work uh, but that's top F and I'm not straining to get it
and it feels very comfortable and there's no tension. Well, you know, that's, of course, there's no tension because you're not supposed to have tension when you're up there. But sometimes on my SBA, the only way I could get top F was to, was to make all of this very tense, which is, doesn't feel good. Um, and it certainly doesn't lead to consistency uh, in the top range. Um, so that's basically why I put my Selma SBA that I've been playing for nearly 30 years in its case and it hasn't come out since. <laughs>